Today's guest on Clever Conversations is Tom Sosnoff, um, founder of Tasty Works, Tasty Trade, and uh, formerly Thinkorswim. I won't butcher your intro, Tom. I'll let you kind of tell us who you are and if you could share some of the entrepreneurial journey. You know, I know you started out as an options trader. Maybe you can take us back and just tell us about your, your entrepreneurial path and We'll keep the conversation going and then I'll let everybody kind of chime in and ask some questions about 20, 25 minutes in. But thanks. First of all, thanks for being here, Tom. And maybe you can give us a little background on how you got to be where you were or where you are. <laughs> where I, was, I, I don't like where, the past tense. Um, no, where, where you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I'm going to be, but um, uh, so, so I'm kind of an industry. Thanks everybody for, you know, coming on board and hanging out and everything. Um, I've, I've been around this business now for going on four decades, 40 years. So it's a, it's a long time in the, in the financial world and um, 20 years as an option market maker. And then uh, just like Michael said, and then uh, uh, 10 years building Thinkorswim and 10 years building Tasty. It, it looks like I have a 10 year, that's my, that's my Theo Epstein um, driven 10 years at one job and it's time to you know try something else. Um, I've pretty much been uh, you know, I like building, I like building stuff. So I think my, my journey as an entrepreneur is really, um, just about doing things. I've reached a point in my life where I only do stuff that's kind of fun for me. And obviously I love this space. So what I do is fun and, um, we've had some success, you know, I mean, we're not, I, I wouldn't say we're like a unicorn, um, builder, but we're, we've built some pretty amazing firms, two firms for, you know, almost a billion dollars or this one's more than that. And, you know, and it's, it's pretty, pretty cool over the last 20 years. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to go ahead and just say it's unicorn status um, because okay. I think technically a billion is a unicorn and, the, and your most recent sale is over a billion. So you get unicorn status from the Rangers here at the regiment. Hands right, we'll, down. We'll, we'll take it. It's, it's okay. Yeah. We'll take it. Yeah. You know, I'm former floor trader myself, um, that transition from moving off the floor to trading online was interesting for myself. I wonder how much of that transition, like when you left the floor at the SIBO, maybe you could give us a little insight into your experience on the floor, like what you learned as a trader. Cause a lot of times, you know, the open outcry pit traders were just, it was a good, coffee table conversation piece. It wasn't like, what did we actually learn down there? But maybe you could share what that transition was like when you left the floor, why you made that transition, why, what was the impetus behind it? And what did you learn? And how did that, how did those experiences on the floor help you when, when well, you left? You know, I mean, I pretty much started trading pretty, pretty much right out of college. It was, it was, um, so I, I never really had any other experiences and, um, so my entire professional life, if you want to call it that, was in a trading pit. You know, um, basically I traded the S&P 100, but it doesn't matter what it is. They're all, they're all kind of the same. And it, it, was, it was a process of, you know, we were young kids. We were, didn't really know that much about what we were doing or the world of finance, but I guess we were good at whatever it is that we were doing. And sometimes it's better to be really good at what you're doing than really to understand, you know, why and what you are doing. And so um, I think I just, you know, got lucky in that I found that I was in the right place at the right time. It was the last frontier of kind of hardcore capitalism. Um, the, the pressure didn't bother me in the, um, in the environment I actually thrived in. So um, I, liked, I liked it. And, but about 20 years into the journey, um, I, I thought, you know, it just got to the point where I, I needed more, I needed to do something different. So I felt the industry was going to change. We were going electronic. I would have been, you know, I would have been basically forced out. Um, and so I decided to try something else. And, you know, and that was the, that was kind of the genesis behind building Thinkorswim, which at the time we didn't really know what it was going to be, but I left the floor to build it. Um, uh, and I, you know, myself and at the time, my partner, Scott Sheridan, we, we rolled all the money we had made in the prior years, you know, in the prior decade um, into starting Think or Swim, and we took a shot. And, uh, you know, we both believed in 
kind of the idea and we believed in taking, most important thing was we just believed in taking risk. And we, you know, we taught ourselves how to build software and we, um, I mean, we didn't actually build the software. We just taught ourselves how to find really smart people to build software. And, and we, you know, we struck something, you know, it was like we were, it's almost like you were kind of doing a little exploratory, um, looking for natural resources and, and we put a pole in the ground and we hit oil. And so, um, you know, we stuck with what we knew and, and it worked and we, we changed the industry through building technology. And we were, a, we were a public company and, um, we, we were an attractive public company in the 2008, 2009 meltdown. So we had like three, at least three companies bidding for us at the same time. And we chose TD Ameritrade, I guess, because, you know, they were, they were the strongest of the players. At least we thought they were. Um, and we moved on to the next part of our life, which was building Tasty. Yeah. One thing I remember, and I, I would love to get the background behind it. I could always tell when we would met, meet uh, a Thinkorswim client at a conference, they would kind of look at you. And if you said you were a Thinkorswim client, the first question they would always ask is, what did you get in the mail a week after you opened an account? I thought it was genius. I would love to know whose idea it was to send the stuffed animal um, monkey in the mail. And it was almost like a, a badge of honor if, if you did actually open a Thinkorswim account to get the stuffed animal in the mail. Like, I thought that was one of the best stories I've heard yeah, in marketing. I'll give, you a, yeah. I'll, give you a little, I'll give you a little backstory to that. So when we, when we first built Toss, we were thinking to ourselves, you know, like, we got to do something different. So the first thing we did when we, when we opened, we didn't have any customers. So the first couple of people that signed up, we decided we're going to be geniuses. We're going to give you six bottles of barbecue sauce. What we didn't realize at the time was how expensive it was to ship six bottles of barbecue sauce <laughs> and, and how impossible it was for them not to break. So that lasted about a week. And afterwards, one of the guys that worked for us had written a book. So we, we, we kind of rewrote, we didn't really rewrite the book. We just kind of cleaned it up, put a new cover on it, slapped a new name on it and changed it to be a little more of our style. And we sent a book out to every person that opened an account. Well, it turns out this person didn't really work well. We didn't, we didn't, he didn't work for us. We didn't, I mean, he, he worked for us, but we didn't, we didn't really, he was a little bit of a cancer in the clubhouse, if you know what I mean. And so I decided that, you know, I wasn't going to sell my soul for a book. So I said, listen, we can replace that book with a stuffed, with a stuffed monkey and we'll be, and we'll be fine. And it really started off as a joke. You know, like, and uh, and here's the crazy thing. When we first started, we were paying like $10 a monkey, you know, for the think or swim monkey. And um, um, that was our first, you know, whatever, the first uh, 5,000 of them that we ordered. And then by the end, we were paying like $2 a monkey and ordering 25,000 at a clip from China. So, uh, but the funny thing was it did last. We, we probably gave out a hundred and something thousand, 125,000 monkeys and, and the funniest part was we used to stuff them in house, like our, you know, ourselves. And so we'd have like monkey stuffing parties, you know, into the boxes, into these like little coffins. And we sent a little note inside to people and it was, became a big giant game. And so, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So at, at Tasty, we gave, we gave pins, cherry pins. Yeah. So we hope that now we give you a cherry pin. Yeah. Very cool. So with, and, and you had mentioned like when you opened up, like you only want to do stuff that, you can have fun with that you enjoy and have fun with and i mean that's so important like can you stress the importance for our listeners like how important it is that you really have well, to have fun and enjoy what you do well it's it's not easy first of all it, it's something that comes with there, there's a you know the business of entrepreneurship is not easy and you know anybody that says you know it it, it Anybody thinks that there's a lot of luck involved. I mean, there's a lot of decision making involved. And when you take a lot of risk, you know, you deserve to be rewarded with what seems like luck, but what it really is, is just making a lot of the right choices. Um, it's very difficult, and you know this, it's really difficult to build a, a successful business, let alone a billion dollar business. I mean, not that many people do it. And so, um, so, so 
there, the challenges along the way, you know, are crazy. How do I raise money? You know, do I have the, the, do I have the, um, can I articulate the model? If I can articulate the model, will somebody believe me? And if somebody believes me, will it actually work? And, and so there's all these different, you know, pieces that have to fall into place. So, you know, I, I think for us, um, one of our strengths was that we had very strong domain expertise. And so we stuck with what we were really good at. And we felt like if we are the best at something, which we felt confident we were the best in this derivative space, then, you know, then, then, then individuals will recognize that and they will, you know, they, they will, they will believe us and they will use our product. Yeah. And it holds true today. I mean, Thinkorswim is still um, an options trading platform that TD Ameritrade, you know, leverages for its clients. So it's still in yeah, the marketplace. Thinkorswim, Thinkorswim today is actually, Thinkorswim outlived TD Ameritrade. Thinkorswim is now owned by Schwab and Schwab is getting rid of the TD Ameritrade name and keeping the Thinkorswim name. There you go. It's funny. I always used to tell Fred Tomzak, who was the CEO of TD Ameritrade, I go, you know, when someday TD Ameritrade will be gone and Thinkorswim will be the name of this company, he goes over my dead body. <laughs> yeah, it so out, we, outlasted. We used to, um, when, when TD Ameritrade first bought Thinkorswim, uh, the first thing that, that Fred told me and the management team at TD was like, listen, you know, you guys have built an amazing company, but we hate the name Thinkorswim. And so, because it doesn't fit our image. So we're going to change it to the ultimate trading platform. And I said, that is the dumbest thing you could ever do is trade the new change name. I go, listen, you're paying $750 million. You want to change the name? Go change the name. It's your, you know, it's your money. But it's the stupidest marketing decision ever. And so they, so we argued about it a little bit. And then they hired an outside consulting company. And the outside consulting company came to him and said, this is the dumbest decision you can make to change the name. And so they kept the name. And there it is still today. It's awesome. It's a great name. It really resonates how did you guys come up with that because i've heard of sink or swim you know it's kind of like survival sink or swim but yeah so, sink or swim so i'll yeah. tell you it scott and i were trading in the in the oex pit back in 1999 and i told scott you know i had this idea for building think or swim wasn't initially going to be just a broker firm we had a lot of ideas it, it had you know options on anything there was there was different pieces to it, it had an ria attached originally some different ideas and so I was telling Scott what I wanted to do. And we were, we were 50, 50 partners and everything. And he said, yeah, but what do you want to call this? I go, you got to give me the weekend. Cause I got a couple of names and Thinkorswim was my favorite name. And I just came up with it walking through the middle of my house. I have no idea why. And I came back and I said, Thinkorswim. And he said to me, he goes, he goes, you know what? I kind of like that name. So it, it just stuck between the two of us. When we launched um, a woman who writes a columnist for Cranes, said there's a new company in Chicago that just launched a brokerage, an online brokerage firm called Thinkorswim with a name that's stupid. There's no way they stay in business. That's like an exact quote. And so <laughs> that quote, that quote motivated us, you know, that was bulletin board stuff. And uh, um, so we were thinking at, at first we were OEX traders and we didn't want people knowing what we were doing. So we were going to keep the name Thinkorswim and then change it when we went live. But since you wrote that article, we kept the name and just said, screw it. Let's go for it. Yeah, it kind of became the motivation to keep you going. That's, yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need what stuff if, like that. You know, absolutely. So maybe you can share something, a memory that sticks out to you, like a lesson learned from Thinkorswim, like something that resonates with you or sticks out, like something that would help another entrepreneur like that's trying to build a company. Um, well, I, I think one of the most important things, and uh, I talk about this a lot, is th there's a couple things, actually. For, for starters, don't, don't build a company to solve a problem. Like, nobody gives a fuck. Nobody cares if, about somebody else's problems or what. Like, 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 if you told me you're raising money because you figured out what, like, what somebody else couldn't figure out, forget that. Like, and I also don't believe that there's any, you know, there's no such thing as kind of like an original idea in the formation in the visionary stage. There's everybody has ideas. There's millions of ideas. It's how you, it's how you tweak and adapt and adjust that idea to actually, you know, so, so, 
eventually it fits whatever it is that you become. But don't try to solve any problem and don't worry about who you're competing with. Like the mistake that most entrepreneurs make is they think that they have to either solve a problem or they have to be better than or compete with somebody else. And, and you know, we have never cared about any of that stuff. We don't even look at our competitors. We don't even, we don't even consider them competitors, even though they are, but we don't even look at that stuff. So don't worry about who you're competing with. Don't worry, just believe in your idea and, and just do your thing. Like, like that's the whole key, just do your thing and be able, you have to be able to get somebody excited about what you're doing. Otherwise you got no chance. Like if you can't get somebody excited about your project or whatever it is that you're building, then just forget it. Cause it's, nobody's gonna do it on their own. You gotta learn, you have to know how to sell. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. Um... It's hard to argue too because you've got the the track record, you know, of doing the the successful, you know, exits. Um, and if well, it's we, working we for built, you, it, yeah, yeah. We built three companies in forty years. I mean, we had a prop trading firm that that we built. Scott and I built. It took us, you know, from nineteen eighty seven to 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 two thousand. And we built Thinkorswim in nineteen ninety nine to two thousand and nine. And then we built Tasty from two thousand eleven to twenty twenty one. Where, you know, Tasty will go on and it'll you know, it'll, it'll be a big part of the global scene for the next, you know, couple of decades. And, you know, who knows what happens to, to us. I don't think we're done, but you never know. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, we'll discover, we'll, we'll keep asking questions here, but let's, let's talk about that. Cause Tasty, you know, that was like when, when you guys came out with that, you and, you know, Pat, Tony would get on the, on the bootstrapping and the different shows. Um, and it, it was really like a, almost, it felt like Thinkorswim 2.0 a little bit as an, as an outsider, but maybe you could talk about that transition well, and, and how you guys thought that up. Like, let's, let's do a streaming it, library of shows. Well, when we were, when, when TD bought us, we had to sign, you know, multi-year deal to stay on board and transition the firm. And I did that, but I didn't really like working there. Not because they, they were a good firm. I just didn't like working for somebody else. So I had an idea to try to disrupt the financial um, content business. And I took my idea to the CEO of TD Ameritrade. And I said, listen, his name was Fred Tomsack. I said, Fred, um, you know, you know, I love you, man, but I, I, you know, this is not my thing. You know, I, I don't, I don't like, I don't, I don't like the conference calls. I, it's not, you guys can do this job, but you don't need me. I go, he goes, what do you want to do? I go, I want to build this financial content company. He goes, well, I'll let you out of your contract if you let me invest. And so, so like, that's how that we form very good relationships. Like I don't ever, you know, we're very loyal. So I said, you know, and again, people like to bet on people with good track records. So we, so TD Ameritrade was our first investor in, and I put up, I matched them capital wise. And then that's how Tasty started. And then I brought Christy on board. Um, and then I brought Scott on board and, you know, started the whole thing all over again, brought Woody on board, the whole, the whole team from Thinkorswim joined us and we started everything all over again. And the, I think I remember those early days, literally putting the band back together. Wasn't your first office for Tasty like a, a music studio and like, yeah, River North? Well, well, there, we didn't know anything about production and we didn't know what we were doing. So, but you know, we were confident and cocky. So we, um, uh, we, we were looking for spaces. And, and the funny thing was we walked into this hip hop studio and they were not doing very well. There was no artists, you know, in 2011, there wasn't people renting out space for recording and stuff like that. And it walked into the studio and it was the coolest place, man. It, it had recording rooms and it, it had tenants in it, it and it had cool, cool stuff all over the walls. I mean, it, the place was, was super, it was just really funky. And I walked in and I remember the guy said to me, I go, how much is this place anyway? And he thought we were like homeless. Like he didn't know, you know, look at us. So, so he's, he's like, well, it's like, he, he said something like, it's like, it's like 10 grand a month. And we go 10 grand a month with everything. Like, you know, like you, the furniture stays, everything stays. And he goes, and he goes, he, and he just jokingly said, yeah, I'll do that. No problem. And we go done. And he looked at us and he's like, who are you guys? Yeah, <laughs> and, 15. <laughs> and so we would have paid 20 easily. And so, um, 
And so we rented the place, you know, every single thing in it. We said, we'll take down to the dishes, the food that's in the refrigerator, whatever it is. And it was super cool. And we proved concept for two years there. And we rented every other space that was available in the building because we grew so fast. And we, um, we kicked out all the tenants. We bought a couple of, we bought a dev company. We bought a production company in Chicago because we needed to learn. And we, um, you know, taught ourselves. Crazy, but it worked. Yeah, well, no, it's it's like similar to like how you were talking about like early think or swim that you you taught yourselves how to build the company. You you hired the people that knew how to code and make the software for think or swim. And it sounds like you did the same thing here with with Tasty. Like you found the people that knew how to make the shows and stream the shows online, and you yeah. started building the company from there. There's tons of smart people around that just want to be challenged in interesting roles. And, you know, like when we bought a production company in Chicago, they had they had like 20, 25 people as a small production company. But they had they had like all these huge clients like like Hertz and General 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 Mills and, and you know, Kraft. They had all these huge Fortune 500 companies that were clients. We fired every client on day one. We're like, we don't want to be in your business. They're like, are you out of your mind? It took us 15 years to, to you know, cultivate these relationships. We're like, listen, we're not interested in the business of production for somebody else. We this is all about us. And so we fired all the customers. We fired all the customers. We kept the talent. And we did the same thing on the dev side. We fired all the customers, kept the talent, and you know, and then quickly we had put a firm back together. You know that with you know, with the people we wanted. And so, um, you know, we're, we're all business. Um, there's no, we, we say no high fives, but there's, we're all business. And so um, build what you want to build, prove your concept. You know, the nice thing about having some success is you can raise money easy, easier. So when we went to the street to raise money, you know, people were sure, whatever you guys want. And, you know, and then, you know, that, that that's so when 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 it got to 2021 in tasty there was you know we built this really incredible company and then there's there was five firms bidding for us this year so you know that's why we basically sold because you know with five different firms bidding for you you pretty much can pick the direction you want it to go and i want it to go global very cool very cool um, and how does that look? Will look now. Are you are you staying on for a couple of years with with Tasty with the new group? I signed a five year deal. Now they can fire me anytime, but it's what I love to do. So my my my, I hope that I get to stay, and I hope I get to do my thing. You know, which is just talk to customers and and uh, you know screw around and build cool stuff. And you know, like I hope I get to continue to do what I've been doing all along. But we'll see. You know, I mean. You know, I might fit in. I might not. I don't know. Yeah. Like, like, you don't, you know, you just, you don't really know when, when you kind of hope that the, the people that you're doing a deal with are you, like, they're good. They're, I'm sure they're going to be good people. You just don't know if, you know, somebody like me, I, I like to call the shots. I like to, you know, I, I like to be able to do what it, whatever it is I want to do, you know, so we'll see. I hope it works out. Yeah. Um, that's very cool as well. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I do enjoy bootstrapping in America. Um, when you guys interview the companies that come in, that's a an interesting concept. You know, it's not options trading. So, how how did you guys come up with the the idea for for bootstrapping? Like, what was the, we, the thought we there? To, we needed to break it up. We had so much option content. You know, remember we we create financial content, but it's no news and no guess. So if you watch CNBC, it's basically guests and news bell to bell. So for, you know, eight, 12 hours a day, they do guests and news, guests and news, guests and news. Um, Bloomberg, Reuters, guests and news, guests and news. It's, it's all bullshit to me. It's not actionable. It's not, it's not um, you know, like, I don't really care what somebody else has to say. Like, like, like I'm a trader. I know that if, you, if, if somebody asks your opinion, I don't care. Like, I, I know it's just your opinion. It doesn't mean anything. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, and it's nothing to do with you. It's just, you know, you're just another guy with an opinion about what the market's going to do. And then there's a hundred million other people just like that. I don't care. What Tasty does, which is so cool, is we're a think tank. And so we just bring on, we, we just have a ton of like PhDs, ridiculously smart people, just 
crazy mathematicians who are just working on um, quantitative statistical um, analysis, probabilistic ideas that are all math based. So somebody who's watching it can say, oh, this is kind of cool. No guess, no news. And now we decided, well, we got to break this up somehow a little bit. So we'll throw bootstrapping in there and interview entrepreneurs because people dig that stuff. And it's cool. I liked it too. I did it for the first like six years. Christy's done it for like the last four years. Um, you know, we've had some amazing, you know, we've had more than some amazing entrepreneurs. We've had, you know, almost 3000 entrepreneurs on the show and, you know, for a short 20 minute interview. Um, it's super cool. I, you know, I'll leave it at that. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for us other than, you know, change of pace, but it's cool. Yeah, I really enjoy that. I mean, I enjoy all the, the programming. Um, I'm not trading as much as I was, if any at all, really anymore as I was 10 years ago, but it, it's good to get that that break in the day, so to speak, and and, yeah. and break up the, the, the think tank, so to speak, to get some of the... Yeah, listen, we try to have fun. I mean, I'm, I don't want to listen to people that take themselves too seriously. So, you know, Tony and I screw around all day in addition to, you know, um, we have a lot of really talented people that, you know, that, that, that can communicate on air and don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, so outside of options and, you know, the three companies in 40 years that you've built and exited, you know, what other types of investments do you look at? Are you a private market investor at all? Or are you just, I'm going to build it. I'm going to invest in myself. I'd be curious to know, like what other types of, um, investments you look at? Well, I've made dozens and dozens and dozens of angel and private investments over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, I, you'll be happy to know that my track record, I am over. I've never made a winner um, in 30 years. I don't have a single winner. Um, every single investment I've made, because I'm not very good at betting deals. And I'm, I'm not very good, obviously, at picking people or deals or any of that kind of stuff. So I'm not, I'm not really a good investor, but I've, the lucky thing for me, it's, it's only been a small part of my, my um, wealth or whatever you want to call it. So for the most part, um, the lion's share of everything that I have invested is in my own companies. Got it. Well, that so, makes sense. You know, I believe in what we do and it's worked out nice. I've done really poorly. You know, I feel like it's kind of cool to make investments. So I do it, but I'm just not very good at it. That's all. Gotcha. Um, well, thanks for the the candid uh, response there. You know, a lot of people don't ever like to admit they make bad investments um, or wrong investments. I wouldn't say it was a bad investment, just one that didn't work out. So it's just it's really it's really hard when you talk to somebody like, you know, um, I mean, most of the time I've only been like I've only been like ripped off, so to speak, I mean, meaning like really kind of conned you know, by, by, by some shyster or something only like once or twice, most of my investments that don't work out are really well-intended, smart, young people. I have found that the hard, the hardest part about taking a shot with a 25 year old, you know, is um, like, I'm invested right now um, with a kid that uh, this is his third company and he's now he's 30. I made my first investment with him when he was 23. And they, it didn't go anywhere. My second investment when he was 25. And now he finally has a win. Like, it's hard in your early 20s. And, and I think that, um, you know, when you get into your 30s and it's maybe your 40s, it's, it's a little bit better. Um, the odds are a little bit better. Not because, not for anything other than a certain level of experience and um, maybe you know, credibility, I'm not sure even if credibility is the right word, but, but maybe you just need to be, or go around the block a few times, you know, I don't know. That's maybe that's it. I'm not sure. Definitely the experience and wisdom with age coming is, is definitely a, a real thing. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, there's just not that many, there's not that many Mark Zuckerberg stories, you know, I mean, when, when you really get down to it, um, it's very hard at 20, 21, 22. And, you know, most successful entrepreneurs are a little bit older and they've had some experience and they've networked a little bit. And, um, and listen, I'm not, a, I'm not one of these people that, you know, I believe in dilution. 
I'm a strong believer in dilution. Like you have to raise money when you can. And so I don't have any problem with dilution, but I'm also a person that I don't really give a rat's ass who gives us money. Like, I don't believe that you have to, like the private equity firms that have always invested in us, we've made them a ton of money. But the day they say they want to help us, I'm like, please don't ever talk to me. Just, you know, <laughs> sit back, sit back, relax and wait, wait for me to write you a check. I don't care about your damn opinion. Like nothing drives me crazy than somebody who's not in the business trying to tell us how to run our business. So the, one of the nice things that comes with success is you don't have to deal with, you don't have to deal with that. If you're a young entrepreneur, you got to deal with these private equity firms and venture firms that are on your boards and they have their hooks into you. It's really hard. You know, for us, we don't have to deal with that, which is nice. Yeah. Gives you the freedom of the, all decisions and movement of the company. Success gives you leverage, control and leverage, which is, an, which is, you know, listen, you earn it, but you know, it does make it easier. Yeah. Well, I mean, you put the time in. It's 40 years, three companies. It's not like you just snapped your fingers. You, you had to roll up your sleeves and, and go after it. Um, being in Chicago, I'm curious. Um, and I don't even know, you may have a, a show on Tasty about crypto, but how much have you guys been watching crypto at all or being sure. involved? Are you watching that? And like, sure. are there options own- trades around that? Well, Tasty, Tastyworks is the only platform, the only major platform in America that um, of the, of like, you know, TD, E-Trade, Schwab, Fidelity, we're the only ones and Interactive Brokers, we're the only ones that offer um, uh, cash crypto on the platform 24 seven. So we're live with crypto um, around the clock and um, we've had it now for, you know, the last couple of months. Um, that's cash market only. We also offer the futures, but, but basically we're in the cash we also bought 30% of a company in Chicago called Zero Hash, which is a um, digital asset uh, settlement company. And we bought them pretty good. So um, we, we execute through them. And um, they're a really fast growing young company run by some smart, some very smart young people. And so, um, so we're, we're knee deep into um, crypto. And we're also in the process of being the first firm to launch um, physical gold through secure tokens. So we're going to be actually expanding, you know, our, our secure token offering because we believe strongly in alternative investments. We also launched our own exchange in the last year called the small exchange. Um, so, you know, that's, it's, it's growing. It's, it's a tiny exchange, but, you know, we're one of the, we're the, you know, third or fourth largest futures exchange now in the U S so we'll see what happens. Yeah, Donnie Roberts is one of my favorite people on earth. Um, he's the CEO of Small Exchange, but he's been with you for a long time as well, hasn't he? Donnie, I hired one 21 years ago when we built Thinkorswim. To, he was one of the first seven people. Yeah, and that, that I mean, that speaks volumes. Me being, you know, a founder, if, if you have a team that sticks with you for 21 years, like that speaks a lot about the culture and the fun you're having um and the success but maybe yeah well, go a good ahead. rule of thumb a good rule of thumb is always hire people from buffalo new york <laughs> are you from buffalo i am not <laughs> but donnie is donnie is and so are a lot of other people we we've, we've hired like a, like two dozen people from that went to st bonaventures which is in buffalo and we've um we have a we have a very close buffalo connection it's good blue collar hard work in america that's good to know. I uh, will start a, re- a recruiting trip to Buffalo. Um, maybe we'll go to one of their football games. They seem to have some some fun at their football games up in Buffalo. Well, we um, don't like Buffalo football fans, but we like Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and HA just chimed in. Puckheads is based on Buffalo Sabres. It's Andy's a movie producer in the looking at a, a pilot episode series for these hockey players from Buffalo. Um, and everybody's welcome to chime in. Um, you're, you're welcome to uh, type in questions for Tom in the chat. Or if you want to turn your microphone on, I'm going to go to gallery view. If you raise your hand, I can call on you if, you, if you've got a question for Tom. Um, and then while you guys think of some questions in the meantime, Tom, maybe you could go a little more in depth of what the small exchange is. Cause when I met with Donnie a couple of years ago, when he was telling me about the concept, I th- thought it was a great idea, but 
I mean, since you guys have launched, you, you mentioned you're the fourth largest exchange already. Um, what is the small exchange for, for the listeners? It's a, it's a futures exchange that competes with the CME and the ICE, but the products are smaller notional size, about five to $7,000 in notional size, as opposed to like 100,000. And we're building it up you know, from scratch. We have seven products today. Um, we have a, uh, you know, we have uh, two stock index products, three bond products, and um, a currency product and a precious metal product. And we're about to launch um, an oil product, and then you know, hopefully a Bitcoin product. We have to go through you know the whole OCC approval process and everything else. But it's our goal to be you know a competitive futures market for the retail investor. That's great. And I would imagine there's some probably cross marketing or cross promotional abilities, you know, to the people you've got at Tasty Works and your former clientele at Thinkorswim that well, they should Thinkorswim, be aware. Thinkorswim is not connected to it, but only Tasty gotcha. Works and Interactive Brokers is connected actually too. So we have some good investors. We have Citadel and Jump and um, Simplex and Peak Six and Interactive Brokers and Philip Capital. They're all investors. So we have a strong investor group. But um, listen, it's hard to build an exchange to compete with, you know, the CME. They're, they're big monsters. And, you know, the CME, the ICE, they own the New York Stock Exchange. These guys are huge. And, you know, they don't, they don't want to see us being successful. So uh, the regulators do want to see us to be successful. They want the competition. That's great. Well, it's good to hear that, that that's moving forward as well um, and that you guys are having success there. Yeah. Um, say hello to Donnie for me. Um, I will. Awesome. And do you guys share the same office with Small Exchange, Tasty and Small in the same office? or they're... Um, t The Small Exchange is in our, we have a startup office um, that's over in the West Loop. They share a space with another company we own called Doe, which is a, which is a small um, brokerage firm. So they share an office with Small Exchange and Doe share the building. Very cool. I think I've been to that one too. Um, and that you said that's in the West Loop, right? Yeah, I think I've, yeah. I've been. It's I've on been Aberdeen. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Um, our group is shy today without any questions. Um, typically, hey, Tom, I have a question. There we go. Billy's got a question. Sure. I'm hey. curious what you're going to. Uh... What you're going to say to the new CEO of the group or the CEO of this group that you want to do uh, in the next, you know, couple months? And can I invest? Um, yeah, it's publicly traded. And if you can, it's publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange um, under the symbol IG Capital, and it's actually relatively cheap compared to. Compared no, I to, mean, I'm curious what you're going to tell him you want to do going forward now, and oh, can I invest well, in first, you? <laughs> First of all, it's a woman, and okay. um, yeah, it's an American woman running a um, running a British company, and her name is June Felix, and she seems nice. She seems very smart. I don't know her. Sure. I don't know her other than the few meetings that we've had. Um, she seems clear of the concept. Um, you know, the the initial game plan is for me to build tasty tasty trade and take it global. Uh, you know, a network around the world, and then also to run, you know, to run, um, I think to run the U.S. part of their business. I mean, they own an exchange too. They own Nadex, and uh, they have a Forex business in the U.S. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty to do. It just ultimately depends on, you know, is, is this the right, is this the right mix? Is this the right sure. place for you? You know, like, like you never know that stuff. Like, I'm going to get along with everybody because that's my, that's my personality. I mean, I'm going to be the largest shareholder of the company. So <laughs> I, I got to love the company, you know, sure. so, so um, I'm excited about it. I want it to go global. I just, I didn't, I'm not excited about the pandemic, obviously, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited that, you know, we're going to get a chance to take our message and take our technology. There's only one firm that's truly global right now, and that's Interactive Brokers. And I feel that there's a very ripe opportunity for us because there's only one firm to compete with. Globally, you yeah. and so I, I love going up against interactive brokers. You know, they're I know them well, and I feel like we can compete on every level with them. And I'm kind of relishing the opportunity. Cool. 
I'm curious, like when you say go global, is that with the content or is that more like the brokerage execution it's both. Or, or both? It's both. I want to go, I want to go 24 five with content and I want to take our execution platform and, and they're licensed in 17 countries. And I want to add 17 countries, you know, to our, to our offerings where we can solicit business and, and we can bring business back to the U S so yeah, no, it's both. It's going big time. Gotcha. Well, maybe the investment here is Rosetta Stone software. Sounds like Tony and Christy are going to have to learn some some new languages. How no, did, how... no, no, no. We're, we're 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 very ethnocentric. Everything gets done in English. We don't. There's not. You know, it's too hard to do it the other way. So would you do like subtitles? Like if you're no. like, nope, just no. going to be in English. Yeah, yeah. The only place that's a problem is is kind of Japan, um, but but everywhere else, you know, even in China, it's not a problem. Um, China, Singapore, Taiwan, it's not a problem anywhere. The English, India, it's not a problem. I mean, every, English is the language. South America kicks be sometimes a little bit of a problem, but for the most part, it's really just Japan and, you know, we'll deal with it. It's just something you have to deal with. Yeah, interesting. Well, that's, I mean, it's a big vision. I love it. Um, and it's good to have that bogey out there, you know, with Thomas Petterfee at Interactive Brokers being international you know you make a good point that there isn't a ton of competition there so um no there's can... literally there's literally one firm i mean there's in the u.s markets you know the, you know i mean to a certain extent we'll compete with eToro too because they're but they're an israeli firm but in the u.s markets here td schwab fidelity e-trade none of them are none of them are international none of them are, are capable of going international so it's it's just interactive brokers and then it's going to be us so that, you know, we'll have an opportunity to go after the global markets. And, and I love that stuff, I man. That's, you know, listen, Interactive Brokers is a $30 billion company now or close to it, whatever it is, 28 billion. You know, um, we're going to be a $4 billion or $5 billion company. You know, it's, I like being the underdog. That's cool. Well, I can tell you're, you're jazzed up about it. So, um, oh, yeah, we're going to follow along for sure to, to watch the next phase of growth here with you guys. It's going to be going to be exciting um and and fun to watch you know maybe it won't take 10 years for the next you know unicorn exit for you maybe you <laughs> get it down to get it down to five it looks like you've got a I'll five be, year I'll be deal. dead so i'll be dead so it's like you know it's okay I'm, i don't i don't i don't do anything anyway i'm i'm a one trick pony i don't i don't have any other life i mean i don't have any hobbies i don't have any i don't go anywhere i was um, just gonna ask like what outside of like when you're not you know, having fun in the office with the team and when you're not on the, you know, yeah, I, I, doing I the show, like what, what do you do to pass the time? Nothing. Like, this is what I, I'm a, I'm a workaholic and all my friends, we work together and all my, and my whole life is around, you know, what we do work wise. I really don't, um, I'm hobbyless and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really travel much. I mean, other than for work. So it's like, it's, I'm a pretty much a one trick pony. You're definitely collecting the, the, the Campbell soup cans behind you though. That that's definitely. Well, that. Usually, usually I do these shows with the virtual background, but for some reason it didn't, the couldn't get the zoom call up on my virtual background screen. So the Campbell soup behind me is because I live in this, in this loft in the city where there's um, um, where I decided that the, I bought it off this famous sculptor who, when she died, um, I uh, decided I was going to do no artwork, and so I just have cans of soup and cans of corn, and can and bottles of and boxes of cereal as artwork all over the house. It's well, it's great for the the pandemic lockdown. You know, you yeah. you knew you didn't have to go run into the store. Well, <laughs> actually, these are pretty old. I wouldn't touch these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not <laughs> confident that they're any good. It's funny. Looks like John has a question. No, I was just okay. gonna say it looks like you're in a bunker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was kind of thinking it's 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 kind of a weird, yeah, it's a weird look. But John, really, I didn't think I'd be home like you know, a year after this thing started. I didn't think I'd still be broadcasting from my house. Yeah, you need some barbecue sauce, I think. There you I, go. I got, hey, hey, if I showed you my barbecue sauce collection, you'd be impressed. I got like I got like 15 bottles of that craft. It's great. Very cool. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um look, Looks like Brett's got one. Brett's waving. All right, cool. Hey, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine time-wise. Brett, what do you got? 
Hey, Tom. Yeah, just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, the tokenization of uh, legacy financial instruments like the gold one and yeah. what you see, you know, with uh, the roadblocks and the potential for other commodities and other and, and obviously private assets. Yeah, I, I actually think it's it's the tip of the iceberg. I think it's the infancy stage for that. I mean, we are going to be like I said, we're the first firm that offered, you know, Bitcoin, cash Bitcoin, but we're going, we're about to be the first firm next week that offers physical gold through, um, you know, PAX Gold and Secure Tokens. But that is just, the reason we're doing gold is because that's at least a decent sized fund. So it, there's a certain level of, you know, trust there. Um, I guess we'll go silver next when we find the right, you know, when we're comfortable with the right fund. And then after that, you know, it's, we're kind of breaking down the barrier to, I don't see where the, you know, I, as long as it's cash, so it's not considered kind of like a, a future or anything, I don't see where we're going to be limited. I mean, I believe that the next decade, the, the, the next, whatever it is, eight years or something, eight, eight to 10 years, the focus for individual investors is going to be on A, capital efficiency with listed products, and B, alternative investments with non-listed products. And so I think that, you know, whether it's digital assets, like in the form of coins, or whether it's some other kind of token, tokenized, you know, security or, or tokenized asset, whatever it may be, um, you combine that with the potential for, you know, sports, politics, and event-based um, trading. I think they're all gonna be in, in one form or another, they're all going to show up on online trading platforms in the next couple of years. And I think we're, you know, we're breaking the, we're, we're breaking ground right now and doing stuff that nobody else would even consider. Um, but I think it's, you know, as soon as we announced we were doing um, physical gold through the secure tokens, you know, like, like another firm immediately said, we're doing the same thing. Like, it's just, you know, it, it just takes somebody to break the ice. And I think we're going to be the ones that do that. Um, I hope we can continue to, yeah, to answer your question though, I, I'm not sure there's any limitations. As long as the regulators don't get involved, I don't know there, there'll be any limitations. Just a question of how much risk do we want to take as a firm that the counterparty is is good, you know? So it looks pretty clear with uh, staying, you know, in cash and not, you know, no derivatives, right? That's what yeah, you're saying? For the, for the time being, um, you know, we'll have to offer derivatives on a listed exchange like the small exchange where we can do futures and options and, and do it leveraged so that people can trade those. Cause ultimately it's about capital efficiency, but initially um, in order to break the ice, we're going to have to do, you know, fully secured cash products that are not, you know, that basically we have to guarantee or we have to trust the counterparty. It's not my favorite, but it, it's the only way to break down the barriers. Thank you. Sure. Good question. Yeah, it was a great question. Must have been a University of Wisconsin graduate. That seemed like a very smart question. I've known Brett for, for a long time uh, since college. So um, always good to get another fellow Badger on the, on the show. Um, again, Tom, thanks for spending some time with us. Always a pleasure to see you. Congrats again on the, on the recent sale of Tasty to IG Group. Uh, wish you the most success. In, in the future with everything you're doing and say hello to Donnie and thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you next Thursday. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks.